Today on Judge Faith, an Idaho handshake deal for the purchase of a used snowmobile breaks cousins apart. The first time that they had asked for the title, I told him that the, I still owed the bank $1,800. We got a text message from him that basically said, I've done all this stuff for you. I don't owe you anything. And you just want me to accept the words that are coming out of your mouth. And when it doesn't make a lot of sense, one, it usually means it's just not true. And later, strangers, each blaming the other for a fender bender, bring their Texas toss-up to court. Then she said, I do have a guy who works off the side. If, uh, you know, I'm gonna go up there to him and then I'll give y'all a call. And I told her I knew a guy that, that could fix, you know, the damages for a little bit of nothing. I never agreed to pay anything for their vehicle. It may be one of those cases where you didn't see each other and you hit each other. Faith Jenkins. Her distinguished legal career began when she graduated first in her law school class. She quickly became a tough New York City prosecutor and then a preeminent legal analyst on cable news. And now she's the judge in her own courtroom. Her cases are real and her rulings are final. She is Judge Faith. Plaintiffs Nayla and Jared Morton say they bought a snowmobile from their cousin that was later repossessed. They're suing for the cost of a snowmobile. Defendant Tyson Martin says his cousins are suing the wrong person because they were aware that the bank was holding the title to the snowmobile. All rise, court is in session. The Honorable Judge Faith Jenkins presiding. Please be seated. Your Honor, the litigants have been sworn in. This is the case of Morton and Morton versus Morton. Thank you, Honor. Nayla and Jared Morton. Yes, Your Honor. You are suing the defendant Tyson Morton for $5,000, the cost of a snowmobile? Yes, Your Honor. Are, are you all related? Yes. How? Cousins. The two of you are cousins? Yes. Okay, and you are? Cousins-in-law, yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Why don't we start from the beginning? Okay. My cousin and I, we grew up together, and we were really pretty close. And uh, we were working in North Dakota, and uh, we called him up one night, and I just met him, and we... We're outside the restaurant, and I just saw his uh, snowmobile, his new one, in the back of his truck, and he had his old one with him. And I was like, hey, you want to sell your old snowmobile? And he said, yeah, I'd sell it. And I was like, I'll give you 5000 for it. And, and so what was going on? You had a new snowmobile. You yeah. were selling your old one. Yes. And uh, I hadn't planned on it. Uh, he asked if I would, and I agreed. Yes. OK. And so because you had just got a new one? Correct. Was there a written <laughs> agreement between the three of you? No. no. Okay, so it was all oral. You agreed to a price of $5,000. Did you immediately take possession of the snowmobile? No, it was a few months down the road when he brought it up to Sandpoint okay. for me. Okay. But you made monthly payments? Yes. And so it was still in your possession? Until the middle of the summer. Okay, perfect. And so you agreed that they paid you $5,000? Yes. Do you have proof of that with you today? Yes, I do. Let me, may I see it, please? What ends up happening, you pay $5,000 for the snowmobile, <laughs> you obtained possession of it in the summer of 2012, where's the snowmobile now? Uh, I got a phone call from Tyson. He said that uh, the bank that he had, the, my title, I guess, for the sled that I bought from him, mm -hmm. he had that title under his new sled as collateral to pay for that new sled. And I didn't know that. I'm, so you didn't have a title when you finished no. paying the $5,000? You never Despite got a title? My, I was always asking, every time he was on the phone with Tyson, hey, Ask Tyson for the title, have him send the title, have him send the title, and basically our response we got was, I'll do it when I can, I'll send it when I can, I'll send the title when I can. So were you seeing him during this time frame? The two of you were close, you're we, friends, we, right? We did a couple of times, we went snowmobiling building together one time since I had bought the sled from him. Mm -hmm. And um, he came up one summer um, and we rode street bikes together. So you're not but, curious at this point why it's taking him so well, long to get the title? I am, but he's it's his cousin, so he just yeah, I just it. trusted that he would get me and, the title. And you say that's not the case. You told them something about the title. What did you tell them? Uh, the first time that they had asked for the title, I told him that the, I still owed the bank $1,800 to pay for that title, which I did do. You, you did do what? Well, I had purchased the sled, paid off free and clear. Mm -hmm. And then I re gave them the title back you for my new sled. You gave the title back? The bank. The bank. Mm -hmm. before, this is before selling to Jared. Mm -hmm. I gave them that title for collateral. And for your new For my new sled. Sled. And when I agreed to sell the sled to Jared, I had called my bank and asked them what they would want for that title back. Mm -hmm. And they wanted it paid to two-thirds or 
below Blue Book value on the new one. So did he have that conversation with you? No. That, you're saying that conversation never happened? No. Okay, so one of you is not telling the truth about that. I believe it did. What I, do you uh, mean you believe it did? It either I did believe the conversation didn't. happened. Well, you, were, you, were the, you would be a part of the conversation. So did it happen? Did you tell him that? I, yes, I did. You don't seem too sure. Because everybody's saying that I didn't. No, I, no, I'm not. I'm not saying you did. I'm, I'm asking you a question. I, and to answer your question, yes, I did tell him that the bank had the title. That's why I hadn't given it to him. Where's the proof that you paid the bank eighteen hundred dollars for the title? I have none. I'm sorry. I have none. It was a conversation over the phone with my banker. It no, 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 no. I'm not writing. talking about the conversation with your banker. I'm just I want to see proof, like they brought me proof today that they wrote you checks worth $5,000. Because I, I if you pay the bank $1,800, they're going to send you a title. It, it, true, but not yeah. out of state. I was out of state working. You have a phone that works out of state, right? Where you can make a phone call and tell the bank, I have a new address? Yes. You have a phone, right, yeah. that works that way? Yes. <laughs> Coming up. A call to the repo company reveals the rest of the story. I did some digging and I called the uh, credit company that came and repossessed the sled from us and they sent us a photo. And later, Texans asked the court to decide which person must pay for their auto accident. What's the first thing she said to you? I know you just didn't hit me. And what's the first thing he said to you? He said, no, he said, you hit me. I said, no, I didn't. So what y'all want me to do here today? Plaintiffs Jared and Nayla Morton say Tyson took advantage of their kindness. They're suing for the cost of a snowmobile. Defendant Tyson Morton says he owes nothing and his cousins are suing the wrong person. So what ends up happening to uh, the sled, sir? Why, why don't they have it in their possession if you paid the bank $1,800? They started repossessing my stuff that it was on collateral for, mm -hmm. and they used that title against me because they still had it in their possession. They called me and asked where the sled was at. I told them that I had sold it to my cousin. They asked for his number. So they repossessed the sled yes. from your cousin, yes. the one that they paid $5,000 yes. for. The one that I had already paid $9,000. The one that you say you actually paid, and it wasn't being used as collateral, but somehow the bank was able to come in and repossess it. How is this their problem? The bank's problem? No, how is this their problem? I, this is not their problem. I believe it's the bank's problem. They double dipped on it. No, I think it's your problem because you don't have any proof to me today that you actually ever paid the bank $1,800 to get this title. And your reasoning for, n for not getting the title is um, pretty ridiculous. <laughs> it is a reason. It's a ridiculous reason. It's unbelievable. I have also done a lot of stuff for Jared personally. I've taken them on jet boating trips. I've paid for vacations. I've done a lot of different and, things. And what does that mean to you? I guess I wasn't in any big hurry to get him the title, essentially. That was, I should have gone out of my way more so and got him the title, but I did not. I mean, he's paid you $5,000. And you have an obligation, if, if you sell someone a sled, a vehicle, you have an obligation to provide them with a title once really they've purchased it. And you didn't do that. Correct. And, and that's a problem. And your reasoning just doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't think you ever paid the bank $1,800. And you have no proof of that. If you really had proof, if you had proof of that, that's the most important. You showed up here <clears throat> in court today with absolutely nothing, no paperwork, nothing. And you just want me to accept the words that are coming out of your mouth. And, you, and when it doesn't make a lot of sense, Juan, it usually means it's just not true. The bank comes to repossess the sled, and what's the next conversation you have with him? You know, we didn't talk a whole lot with Tyson after that. He kind of dropped off for a while, but eventually Jared found a snow bike that he really liked, and he knew it was a good deal. So he called up Tyson and, Tyson, and asked Tyson if he would be willing to um, pay payments so that we could buy this bike and it'd be like paying us back for the bike. And he agreed to that. And so what happened with that? We bought the bike but we just didn't get, ever get any payments from Tyson. None? And then, Zero? No. Nothing? Why do you make a payment to them after you agreed to make a payment? Because I simply couldn't afford it. I was struggling to survive. I have $1,000 So then tell them that instead of, instead of agreeing to, to, the, to this deal. Because Go I, ahead. I, 
presumed that it would be possible when realistically it was not. Okay. Um, then we got a text message from him that basically said what he had said earlier. I've done all this stuff for you. I don't owe you anything because I've let you stay at my house, go snowmobiling, you know, ride my Harley, that kind of thing. And what was your response to that? We chose not to respond. And so your relationship since all of this has happened is, is what now? Um, we haven't spoken in quite some time, actually. When I knew I was going to take Ty try and take Tyson to court, I did some digging and I called the uh, credit company that he that came and repossessed the sled from us, and they sent us a photo and the Craigslist ad of when they sold the bike. They asked us if we wanted to buy it back for three thousand mm dollars. -hmm. We told them no because we didn't get the five thousand from Tyson. We didn't have the money. We already paid five thousand for it. We weren't going to mm -hmm. pay more. Let me see that to you. Snowmobile. Sorry. Okay, and, and by the way, did the bank tell you anything about um, the reason that they were coming to repossess the bike? Yeah, they didn't tell me why. They just were saying that he hadn't been making the payments on it, so they were, but I, as I understood that he did have it paid for, mm -hmm. so I just didn't know why he wasn't giving me the title, and then they said that it was under his new sled. That it was being used as collateral? Yeah. Okay, uh, that sounds about right to me. You should at least request a copy of the title or something right. when you're purchasing a $5,000 sled from someone because clearly you would have known that it was being used as collateral if you'd gotten a copy of it. We just figured where he's he, family. He that kept that away from him. you because he didn't want you to know that it was being used as collateral and you were paying him $5,000 without knowing that it was still being used as collateral because he had a new bike. That's what happened. And then at the end of the day, when you didn't make payments on the new bike, they came and took the old bike away from them and it was repossessed. So the value of the bike as it stands today, which is $3,335, that's what you owe them. Just before the plane of $3,335. Good luck to all of you. that the relationship is restored and that we can actually be friends again and that we can do things together. I miss my cousin. We haven't spoke for quite some time, so hopefully it gets better. Plaintiffs Frank and Demetrius Parrish say the defendant hit their car and now is blaming them. They're suing for a damaged car, missed work, and pain and suffering. Defendants Karen Hobbs and Denise Pratcher say they don't owe any money because the accident wasn't their fault. They're countersuing for a damaged car. Frank and Demetrius Parrish? Yes. yes, Your Honor. You are suing the defendants Karen Hobbs and Denise Pratcher? Yes, yes Your, Your Honor. Honor. Okay. <laughs> for $5,000, you say they caused uh, damage to your car as a result of a car accident. Yes, yes. ma'am. And you're also suing for missed work and pain and suffering? Yes. yes. And you are countersuing for $3,000 for damage to your car. Yes, Your Honor. As a result Honor. of the accident. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so why don't we start from the beginning? I take it the two of you didn't know each other prior no. to this accident. No, oh, ma'am. Okay, and so can we pull up the map of this location? Okay, why don't you walk over to the uh, flat screen, sir, and just show me which lane you were in and which direction you were traveling. What time of day was this, by the way? Uh, about 9.30, 9.35 in, in the morning. In the morning? Yes. Okay, so rush hour. Yeah, um, not really. A little after rush yes, hour? Yes, yes. Okay. I was in the far left -hand lane. And uh, the defendant was over in the far right-hand lane. Mm -hmm. and there was an 18-wheeler making his uh, right turn, which was in taking both the middle lane and the right lane. Okay. While he was making his turn, the defendant stopped here. And uh, as the truck was making his drive, and I was still traveling up no northbound, and she came from the far right lane over and hit me on the passenger side door. Okay, did you see her crossing lanes of traffic? Yes, uh, I saw her. It was too late for me to even stop or do anything else. Okay, why don't you step back over okay. to the... Uh, were you in the car, ma'am? No, I was not. Were you at the scene at all? I came after, after the accident. After the accident? moved off. The okay, so road. you say that you were driving... I was in the, car in the far left lane, and you saw her go behind the 18-wheeler. Well, as well before the truck finished completing his turn. Okay, she, he's turning. She didn't. You're saying she, got she didn't want to wait, and, right? And, and she came. crossed two lanes and hit you. Exactly. And the damage. Let me see the damage to your car. You say that's the damage to the right side of your car yes. where you say she hit you, and you say something completely different happened. Yes, Donna. Okay, can you pull up the map? Coming up on Judge Faith. 
the court considers the question of who's at fault for the accident. You know, well, this is one of those accidents where there's no police report. Right. We have a voicemail. An admission. Right. Telling yes. us to come up to her friend to get our car fixed. I would like to hear that. Plaintiffs Demetrius and Frank Parrish say Karen hit their car. They're suing for a damaged car, missed work, and pain and suffering. Defendants Karen Hobbs and Denise Pratcher say Frank is at fault for the accident. They're countersuing for a damaged car. Okay, I was over here in the middle left lane right here to the left, and Mr. Um, Parrish was on the, the left-hand side. Actually, I was in the middle, and he was on the left-hand side right here. And it was a truck, like right up here some kind of way across the lane. And I was here, I wasn't even moving. And when I looked up, he was coming from the left-hand side, and he kind of like curved over, and he hit my oh, front left fender. No, in the front, on the side. Okay, and then so we, you say he came into your lane. Yes, ma'am. I was, I was sitting still. I was in the middle lane. I wasn't on the far right. I was in the middle. Okay, so you, you're saying you were not changing lanes at all? At all. I was not. I was sitting there. Okay. All right. Because and where's the damage to your car? There it is right there. So you had not changed into the middle lane. You were already in that lane of traffic? I was already in the middle lane. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So you get out of your car. What's the first thing she said to you? I know you just didn't hit me. And she told the story. And, uh... and, what it, and what's the first thing he said to you? He said, no, he said, you hit me. I said, no, I didn't. So what y'all want me to do here today? You want me to determine <laughs> who went into the middle lane? Well, well, not really. I just wanted um, for my repairs to my damage on my vehicle. Okay, what, what do you have to say, ma'am? When I drove up, the first thing she said to me was, I've already talked to Mr. Parrish and we have a degree to settle out of court. I looked at him, I'm like, no, you're gonna call the insurance company. That's what I pay for. Uh -huh. So I looked down at her, she got a boot on her foot. And I were you supposed right. to be driving? Oh, yes, yes. ma'am. Actually, it was like a little shoe. It wasn't, it was like a little shoe boot, but I was able to drive. I mean, okay. I had no re restriction for my doctor not to drive my vehicle. Okay. Well, Go ahead. and then she said, uh, Based on well, I, I, don't, I don't have much <coughs> money, but I do have a guy who works off the side. If, uh, you know, I'm gonna go up there to him and then I'll give y'all a call. Is that true? No, Your Honor. Well, no more. The only thing I did say, Your Honor, I told that I knew a guy that, that could fix you know, the damages for a little bit of nothing. I never agreed to pay anything for the vehicle. Okay, and what's your role in this? What are you a witness to? I, I, my role in this is because I am the you policy daughter? holder. I am her daughter. Okay. Um, we're on the same insurance policy, and they subpoenaed me saying I was being sued for an accident I had absolutely nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. You know, well, this is one of those accidents where there's no police report. A voicemail? We're a voicemail, voicemail that, from uh, her. An, an admission? Right, Telling yes. us to come up to her friend to get our car fixed. I would like to hear that. Hi, Mr. Bell. This is KK calling, uh, the lady who did the accident. Uh, I was calling you to see if you could meet me at this car place uh, so I could see, you know, give me an idea about how much you'd call him to fix it for me. You do say fix it for you. What do you mean by that? Because I knew the guy. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know him, so that's why I said he was going to give me her, they would right, give they gonna a give price. me a deal for it. Here, here's where we are. Um, so we have a, a car accident case here. There, there's two steps to it. There's the issue of liability and there's the issue of damages. Coming up, Judge Faith Rules. And now, Judge Faith Rules. This is truly a case of one person's word against the other, and I'm looking for some kind of independent evidence that would tip the scales one way or the other, and I just don't have it here. I just don't have it. I can't find which one of you were at fault for the accident, and this may be one of those no-fault accidents. It may be one of those cases where you didn't see each other and you hit each other. I don't know. I cannot make a determination. So on both of your cases, I'm going to have to dismiss them. Good luck. All right, thank you. <laughs> very disappointed. Uh, evidently, Ms. Hobbs is very, very good at telling lies because she believes her own lies. So I guess that's why it was so believable here today. Thank you, Judge, for the outcome, even though I had to pay to get my vehicle fixed, which is fine to Danny. So maybe they will get their sticks. If you or someone you know has a dispute, don't take the law into your own hands. Let Judge Faith rule on it for you. To submit your case, go to judgefaith.com and tell us your story. See you in court.